No, I'm not Kyle Miller or Tom <laughs> Kurtz. Um, our speaker has, is, came down from CMS and is somewhere in traffic between Baltimore and here, so we're going to press ahead. Uh, I've actually had some experience. I've, I've had a chance previously to look through his slides. If he gets here, we'll switch, but I don't want to hold you all up in getting to this particular topic. And um, uh, Rose and Desiree will collect him as soon as he gets here. Um, the topic of ICD-10 and the 5010 transaction standard is really what this particular workshop is about. And so we'll work through his slides, and I'm sure I will give you my perspective on what I think CMS has actually been doing with this, which might be a little different than what he would say. But uh, let's press ahead anyway. Um, these are the, the clear topics, and, uh, and the perspective of this was to look at CMS's um, uh, move towards ICD-10, and they've been extraordinarily firm on their timetable for both the 5010 standard and uh, the ICD-10 conversion. And so we'll go over a variety of activities that are part of the slide set th uh, that occurred here. Um, these particular modifications really change both the clinical uh, coding documentation as well as the procedural coding documentation. And the ICD-10 codes will completely replace the ICD-9 codes for all settings in which we have uh, some activities. For the procedure set, it's really looking at hospital inpatient procedures and a um, uh, coordination with the HCPCS codes and the CPT codes that will continue to represent procedural coding for outpatient uh, uh, activities. Uh, the key is that the 5010 standard, if you haven't already gotten to the point where your uh, billing vendors are in fact testing, and there is a period of testing that occurs so that the 5010 standard for billing has to occur first before ICD-10 can come into place because it in fact changes the number of fields that are available and many of these things that I'm sure um, you all have heard when you've gone through in-services on this. But the key is October 1st of 2013, we switched from the ICD-9 to the ICD-10. And the CMS has remained quite firm in that particular date, despite several opportunities to uh, let that slip. So my impression, at least uh, from what I've seen in both practices and on our um, dialysis business side at Fresenius, is that we believe this is going to be a, um, this is going to be a firm date. Uh, from CMS. So uh, this was an area to, uh, this particular slide uh, was to discuss why are they moving to this and what are some of the things. It's, it's really that it's just a very antiquated old system. It has some other features that are also uh, difficult, certainly on the clinical side, probably less so on the billing side, and that is the nomenclature is not really clinical nomenclature, even though it's diagnosis coding. The nomenclature has been very, very difficult to develop adequate tools for. And so the, um, the way they've done the five-digit coding system uh, mean that the chapters are full and they've, been, they've had to replace with things that aren't consistent with the uh, particular nomenclature that's been done. And so ICD-10 is designed to really update this, include it, and you'll see in a minute a slide where you realize just how vast the change is that these particular codes uh, have. Um, whether these are true advantages or CMS's perceived advantages, I can't, I can't attest to and, and um, wouldn't really want to say. I'm not convinced this will be less staff time for claims coding. And certainly at the beginning, it is a somewhat, it's a much more detailed specific coding. So if there is a procedure, for example, on a joint, it's coding the right versus the left. It's coding details of the procedure. And so it is a much more detailed uh, uh, analysis, which means our systems, our clinical systems that are capturing this information have got to be able to quickly drill through the list to get to the most appropriate and detailed code. I'm not certain that means less time. It's certainly at the beginning. I do think it means that all of the systems that people are in the midst of implementing are going to have to look at ways in which they try to optimize how you look through the codes because the standing sort of face sheet uh, super bill that we've used for many, many years on paper and has been replicated many, many times um, on uh, electronic systems is in fact um, going to have 
seven, eight times as many codes on it, and that's going to that's going to logistically be uh, sort of an interesting problem. Um, so I think certainly your your vendors that are now working on the transaction code sets and the 5010 standards need to also be working on how they're going to address the issues of uh, uh, the ICD-10 complexity. I do think the bottom bullet is true. The ability to, here's, here's what CMS tells me. They say they're interested in being more transparent about claims and, and the claims process and submission, and they want to tie that more to their reporting process. So the ability for them as a payer to match payment to the work involved and match payment to a more detailed set of how do claims reference um, actual diagnoses that patients have, it should be substantially better if, in fact, we can all use this system. So it's not a situation where um, there aren't potential benefits from this. There are substantial potential benefits if, in fact, they're applied appropriately. So um, the HIPAA issues are really, um, I think, you know, as part of HIPAA, all of this information is sort of critical to HIPAA's view of how it bills and codes for transactions. Um, I think that on the front end, the 5010 standard sets the goal. The ICD-9 to ICD-10 conversion should create more detail, and the billing intermediaries that actually process the claims have a lot of work to do on, on their side to um, uh, make this work, as do the payers, the fiscal intermediary payers or the MACs that will be, in fact, uh, administering these. Um, so let's move on to um, ICD-10 is no worse than other HIPAA standards. Well, that's not necessarily easy news as well, because some of those standards have been good, and some have not actually been promulgated yet. The uh, privacy standards, for example, that were extended under the um, uh, the ACA and other legislation going back to the MIPA legislation haven't completely been updated as well. There's a rule that's due to come out the end of this month on some of the privacy issues on how data is used, the ways in which data can be shared amongst um, uh, entities that are covered entities under HIPAA. So, you know, again, this is a big deal as far as I'm concerned. It's not a small deal. And it is a sequential deal that says we've got to deal with the billing side first, then we've got to deal with the clinical side. And I think the clinical side is going to be actually quite a bit harder. Uh, okay, here are some of the, the core changes. The field lengths are expanded so that it's a larger field set and the format's really completely different. So this sense that we all understand 585.3 or 585.5, um, it's going to look substantially different. And that's going to be a um, big change for us because clinicians have, in fact, learned some of the codes they use frequently. And those codes are likely to change. And so the mental memory that occurs that helps you work through your day very efficiently, I think that's going to be a big struggle. And it's been underestimated, in my opinion, uh, on how that's going to play out. Here's sort of the big change. You may have seen this previously, but we go from a um, uh, sort of three to five, minimum three, five character optimum length to a seven character length. And the um, codes go up from 14,000 plus to uh, almost 70, uh, not quite 70,000 codes. Um, there is substantial flexibility that allows them to add additional codes, and the detail is incredibly specific. Um, I think there are some examples in some of his slides uh, later. Um, I don't know what lax laterality means, so I'm not even going to try to interpret that. Um, I um, assume that means that it's very broad for a given disease set, but that's a term that I don't actually know. Um, so um, here would be, for example, um, uh, one particular code in which there was a single code in the current ICD-9 set, and there are 24 codes with detail. And you can see that the detail goes down to, for example, in this case, the traumatic incident of being struck by something. Well, if it's a soccer ball, a baseball, a basketball, all makes a difference. Um, uh, amazing, don't you think? <laughs> 
So imagine what it looks like if you've got membranous nephropathy. And uh, so they're going to want to know, you know, you know, all the variants on, the, on this field. Diabetes will have many, many codes and many, many things that are associated with it. Um, there, there is something that will help us, though. And um, uh, here are some renal disease codes to give you a sense of, of where they are. Um, I don't 100% understand this slide, but, but my sense is, is that this recognizes that, for example, for the um, glomerular diseases, instead of using what was, as I recall in the ICD-9 set, a relatively unspecified code, and I cannot remember what it was at this point because I have not built that in a couple of years now, um, it gets down to the actual pathologic entity. And so if, in fact, you can provide the pathologic entity, it's one way in which they'll understand uh, the distinct pathologic entity. And clearly, the suffix areas that are out to the end of this get much closer to actual clinical and clinical pathologic lines. Language, uh, which I think will be good for physicians. Um, but I do think this will be difficult because in many cases we don't know necessarily some of the specificity that's, uh, that's required. So what's included, what's excluded is going to be substantially more difficult. Uh, procedure codes, they sort of went through the same thing. There were really a very small number of procedural codes under the outpatient procedural piece of ICD-9. And if you look, look at that, that's increased by um, an enormous amount. I mean, that's, a, that's about 20 times as large. So the specificity and, and the other things are similar. It creates a way in which for hospitalized patients, the DRG system will become much more specific. And so they'll be in a position, CMS will be in a position to capture uh, much better the components of a confinement of care that's uh, occurring in a hospital. Um, and I guess this is a um, uh, adhesion surgery, it looks like, for an open peritoneal. Uh, recision. I think for surgeons and others, I mean, it's going to take a long time to try to drill down past these things. And so the tools that need to be developed have to start with sort of the core set and have you essentially keep adding the level of detail till you actually come up with a code. Um, that certainly isn't the process that we've been used to, certainly in the outpatient arena where m most of you probably have practices. Uh, but it is, uh, it's clearly going to be uh, complex. This is also a really complicated slide. <laughs> I'm assuming these are the six procedures you would go through in trying to develop an algorithm that would build the code that you would, in fact, uh, have here. And so as I talked about before, is it right kidney? Is it left kidney? Is it um, in some other location? I assume a transplanted kidney in the pelvis. Um, you know, where was the, um, the procedure accomplished and uh, what was the technique? Now, here's one of the problems that I see. As we innovate new therapies and additional things, as you all know in many areas, uh, it wasn't too many years ago, um, transplant nephrectomies were all open nephrectomies, and then they moved to laparoscopic nephrectomies. So as things come along, there's going to be a whole new set of codes that are developed for these that will extend the set. So the 70 plus thousand codes that are coming with ICD-10 may well balloon by many, many thousands, depending upon uh, what area it is. Recently, um, there was a uh, local coverage decision by the Highmark Group to uh, allow reimbursement for the process of isolated ultrafiltration. Well, as you know, dialysis today is a combination of ultrafiltration and actual uh, dialytic therapy. Well, now there's this whole new procedure that they're carving out. We've done isolated filtration for some time, but it hasn't really had its own set of reimbursement codes. And so this is the first time in which one of the carriers has, in fact, recognized that. That's going to bring a whole other set of, of codes for ICD-10. So, you know, many of you are implementing EHRs right now, and it's a, it's a challenge for the physicians. It's a challenge for administrators to work through the um, pain and sometimes agony of the change of workflow process. I believe we will go through another workflow change in October of 2013 that will be related to this that you need to budget for. You need to appropriately plan because your productive physicians will be a little less productive for a while till they get used to this system. <clears throat> so 
Uh, this is what he talks about 5010. What I know about 5010 is that it's really a replacement of an older standard and it really is the required change to occur that allows for more codes to be accepted on a claim, for longer codes to be accepted, and for us to put this in this increased degree of specificity. In the world that, that I spend most of my time in right now, in dialysis-related finances, it is very clear that um, uh, with the QIP and other things that we have to include on the bill and the comorbids under the bundle, it is very important that we get the appropriate sequence and that we have enough codes to actually put the full diagnostic listing in. Uh, very difficult today and, and I think uh, all of us are doing it as we begin the bundle in a uh, much more kludgy way than, than it needs to be in the future. Here's some of the stuff that CMS is trying to help with, and believe me, there are consultants galore, and I would simply encourage you to figure out a strategy in advance whether you want to learn this on your own, work collectively with other nephrology practices or your billing companies, or in fact go out and hire outside people to do it. There is in fact a... Um, uh, this general equivalence mapping that CMS is going to provide that helps you translate from 9 to 10 and figure out how that will work. Um, the RPA is also going to specify the nephrology related codes and, and we have a work group um, through I believe the payment committee um, is the committee I believe that's taken ownership of this at RPA to in fact create some tools that we'll be able to share with you to try to help you begin to work through that mapping because I believe you all are going to be educating your vendors quite a bit on this more than they're going to be educating you on this and what you need to do is create some plans and demands that they develop a tool that you can use efficiently because otherwise it's going to be a um, not a pretty day. Um, all the systems will require upgrading, so as you contract for systems and maintenance contracts, make sure you try to include these kinds of upgrades because it's really going to be critical that you have an easy path to try to get the help that you need to get prepared for this. Um, I, I'm concerned as well that the other side, the people that actually cut your checks, are, um, may have some, uh, some difficulty with that. Is that Mr. Miller? Hi. Hi. Okay, I'll just keep going. Uh, so here is um, what the strategy is from the payer side, I believe, to uh, accept the claim and uh, develop the ICD-10 groupers and the other kinds of edits that go into the coding analysis that's done. Um, there is a crosswalk, but again, there's so much more specificity in ICD-10. I don't know that the crosswalk is going to be completely useful because it's going to ask you for a lot of things that you aren't currently collecting or you may not currently uh, have in your systems on the specificity side. So um, at any rate, I think there will be reimbursement mapping and there will be a period of testing that begins for the ICD-10 standard at the beginning of next year when the 5010 standard is in. You can then begin preparing yourself to test for the ICD-10 components of that. I think most uh, vendor providers may not be ready. Maybe they will be, but I don't think they'll be ready right at that time. Um, I think the big addition here is the must be submitted by October 1st, 2010 was his point. And that is again that they're sticking to their dates at this point. And um, this includes that the um, diagnoses will be paid for under the rules for ICD-10 after October 1st of 2013. Uh, this is really a timeline of what CMS has done to try to help educate the community. and so. They began in 07 doing a series of internal assessments and recommendations and they began their implementation a couple of years ago with a whole series of webinars and if I, the website here is somewhere, but if you do go to their website about the 5010 standard and ICD-10, there are all of the presentations available for you to look at that get into a wide array of details and in fact you can either replay or get the transcript of all the questions that have been asked. And I've sat in on one or two of these particular calls, and they're really long. You've probably done this too. Um, and uh, get very, very detailed about how do you handle this thing or that thing. But these are some of the, um, um, the areas. So let's see, I don't know. I know Tony Trinkle, but other than, other than that, I have, this is just CMS. 
at its best. Um, and it's a, um, it's clearly an initiative that's not, uh, it is coming down the pike. Uh, I don't know what the slide is, so we'll pass there. This is Kyle's slides. Uh, their policy changes and their training has been ongoing now for quite some time, and they continue to have webinars and various features that will uh, support this, but the testing is really what I think is important. It looks like the complete end-to-end -end testing is available one year in advance for you, but there is this earlier testing of system changes and um, and other things that you and your vendors can begin. The details of how that's done is not clear to me uh, exactly. So look for this um, equivalency mapping system. That's going to be very important. I think there will also be commercial mapping tools. And then there will be tools that probably will be standalone. And you'll have to make a decision. We either can implement something with a current vendor or we need a side standalone system to allow us to capture this information. I think both of those uh, will be available. And um, so, oh, milestones for ESRD. Um, it has the the bad word at the end, the Crown Web word. Um, as you all know, Crown Web is a consolidated reporting system for the ESRD community that CMS is trying to put in place. I would tell you they've been working on it since 1998. It's not yet deployed except in a couple of hundred dialysis facilities around the country. There is a large ramp up phase that is being undertaken at this point, uh, but it's not clear to me that um, uh, exactly how much pain and agony Crown Web will have. But these are frequently the internal systems that, um, that for the ESRD community are related to ICD-10 and the 5010 standard. And Vision is a current uh, system for reporting uh, information to the networks, as well as Remus is the billing and claim system that CMS has. So they are actually working on most of their uh, particular areas. And then this you can download down at the Cyber Cafe. I do think these are very useful websites that CMS has put up, and I would encourage you to go ahead and get educated. If you haven't already, you probably have if you're here. Um, but uh, it's an important feature to do that. And so what I'd like to do is um, really just open up a dialogue. You all may know as much or more about this than I do. I sort of look at it from the perspective of somebody that looks at the IT finance side from a dialysis company's perspective and with a long experience in a nephrology practice. But um, you all are in the middle of this right now, so I would love to hear your comments. Yes? Thank you for filling in. It looks to me like on the on the outpatient side they're replacing. That's my understanding. Now, unless somebody understands something different, my understanding was on the hospital side, the inpatient side, the CPT4 system and the HICPICs stay. On the outpatient side, they may be changing to some degree. Now, if if you've heard otherwise, I, I have not concentrated a lot on the procedure codes. And is it the opposite? It may be exactly the opposite then. I know it's it's segregated. <laughs> I know it segregates between inpatient and outpatient. It's which one stays the same or changes. I, I don't know. It would be easier for us if it, if it in fact works the opposite of what I described because in fact all your E&M codes and all of your sort of uh, in-house activities uh, would still be coded under the typical. My second question is, do we expect that most uh, private carriers will be following that? I think they will. I don't know how quickly they'll move to adopt. I don't think they're going to be adopting exactly the same timetable. But uh, at least in our conversations with some large payers like Aetna, there's no question they're beginning to gear up for the ICD-10. And some of them are actually developing some tools. Whether those tools will actually be useful for anything outside of their own organization, I don't know. But I, I think there will be a move towards that. and. Um, I know CMS has had discussions with um, sort of AHIP and other organizations related to the health insurers. So. Yes, David. Um, I appreciate you filling <laughs> like, um, Even though I probably don't know as much as you all know about this. I'm concerned that we're having a hard enough time with physicians now training them to use AHR, and this is just going to be one of those things that we're going to have to 
much more barrier from taking care. And I'm worried the productivity gets so bad, you yeah. never get anything. Yeah. What do you think that we can do to help get around that up? Is this going to be a big Yeah, I, I would agree with you because I think the process of um, documentation in any EHR is such a change of workflow. When you add to that a substantially increased complexity to the coding system in which all of that mental memory that's built up over years, um, I, I agree with you. I think it will be a substantial productivity hit. From the standpoint of what are best practice strategies, I actually believe one of the things RPA can do is try to convene groups to actually have cross-practice and, uh, and cross-geography discussions of how, how we might actually engage a better process. Our process for this year is going to be to substantially try to start elevating the discussion now that the bundle is here and we aren't completely obsessed over the bundle to try to begin the discussion to educate physicians and begin to get them prepared. That's the first step. But I think the latter strategies are we've got to try to, do, we've got to, try to assist our vendors in developing actual functional tools, not that they think will work, but that you think will work with uh, physician input and practice manager input that's appropriate to try to say, how will the timing of this actually um, work for us? But I do believe, just like your EHR implementation, you're going to go through those weeks and or months sometimes of pain in which productivity will be impacted by this. Um, whether or not there's an opportunity as we evolve our you know, physicians and nurse practitioners actually learn in different ways sometimes. And in many cases, I've seen our nurse practitioners um, learn things in a more directed way more quickly and then teach the physicians. All of these kind of strategies, people strategies and system strategies, I think have to be looked at. I don't have an easy answer, David. Yeah. Yes, sir. One of the bullet points was, we're the last in the world to do this. So what is, does anyone know uh, Yeah, it may be a place to look. I don't know, to be very honest with you. I, I am, um, although we have access to a variety of healthcare providerships internationally in our company, we've really not, we have just begun on an enterprise basis actually creating our workflow for each of the parts of our company and we've not included our international group. I think it's a really good idea to look at that though as a model to see how bad was it, what did it take, how different from this was it. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a good question to bring up. Yes ma'am. Well, let me, let me give you an example of the implication that is why I'm worried about that. Um, under the, uh, the comorbid diseases under the bundle are six disorders, three acute, three chronic. Uh, of the uh, acute dis disorders, one of them is bacterial pneumonia. And um, they've specifically excluded the, uh, those pneumonias which have an unspecified ICD-9 code. So that they've included those that have a degree of specificity where you recognize what the organism was. Well, so much, I'm sitting here, Paul, and he's smiling. He, so much of our um, community acquired pneumonias that are dialysis patients, you never know the diagnosis and you're never going to catch it. You're never going to get it. They're going to be treated and better before, in fact. So what we're seeing is huge difficulty in capturing the comorbids. And number one, these comorbids were identified by actuarial analysis having nothing to do with nephrology, having to do with what it costs to take care of an ESRD patient. And so my concern is, is that the expectation of CMS may not match at all what the practice pattern and the conventions are for managing a variety of diseases. And if specific things are excluded from various, whether it's PQRI related payments or some other payment that bundles something together, 
then those unspecified codes under this system could be very detrimental financially to the practice. I have great concern over that. Great concern over that. I don't, uh, you know, they haven't sort of played their hand on how they're going to apply that. So I don't know exactly where their strategy is. Uh, I do know that um, one of the things that I have had the chance to do since Barry Straub retired was get a chance to talk to him a lot. And he's able to talk about stuff that he couldn't talk about before. And so one of the things to talk about is ICD-10. And these are the kinds of questions that um, certainly on the, in the ESRD world, I've been trying to sort of bring up and say, look, we need to understand the position here. What do you think the strategy is at CMS? And sometimes it makes, sometimes you get, make some headway on that and sometimes you don't. So other thoughts? Doctor. Yes. Um, Here's what we want to do. We want to take your attitude and just clone it and replicate it, okay? <laughs> uh, because in fact, there is no question it will be very useful on the back end um, compared to this arcane system. And I would tell you, having built some tools for these coding systems over the years, um, it was such bad nomenclature that we had to say, we've got to create our own, f what I call a foreign exchange table to recognize what I called things in, in my locality and tie it back to that code because it was totally useless from a searching standpoint otherwise. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Yes, ma'am. nomenclature is terrible and I would tell you the coding engines that uh, the coding assistant engines because in fact we as physicians code our systems never code um, but the fact of the matter is the coding assistant engines will have to become much much more sophisticated and I think it will stimulate the industry to try to build things that are useful but it's the timing that bothers me to get to that and the pain in between that like what you've referenced. David, I think you had your hand up again. Yeah, my concern is just what I heard, and I think <coughs> the problem with ICD-10 is we get reimbursed, or you get reimbursed as a physician for providing healthcare services, not for doing research. This is the best tool in the world for research, but you don't get paid, nor do you have the time for that. And the research, or the, the search engines you just mentioned, are going to have to totally be rebuilt in order to do that, because you're never going to be able to find right. the boy hit by a baseball right. on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> you forgot it's in the left wrist. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I would say a couple of things. This fits into this whole change in the payment system, and tomorrow I'm going to be talking about performance risk and a fundamental changes in the, in the way we are paid. And this sense that we don't do research is also a sense that the government wants us to be looking at not just how we take care of this patient and the next patient and the next patient, but actually whole populations and categories of patients. And so the ability to categorize the population that you care for is going to be incredibly important as we move into this combined fee-for-service, value-based purchasing, performance risk uh, payment systems that are, are being driven. So we'll have needs to do some of those research, but the pure research of taking large aggregated registries of information across practices and populations isn't very practical for what your needs are, you know, in the individual practice. So I do think the ability to do population analytics may well rise to a level that's above the individual practice and into a level in which you are provided some population analytics from the payers and, or from the organizations that you affiliate with that are providing integrated and coordinated care. That's probably not in two years, but that may well be in five or six, seven years. Yeah. Well, yes. Not to my knowledge. I've not heard anything about CPT-5. Any of you that are more AMA savvy than I? No. I haven't heard. I don't know. Yeah. I hope not. Yeah. The interesting thing about 2014, though, is that is the year that the orals come into the bundle. And so there'll be a lot of other sort of disruptive things in our world uh, around that same time. So, well, I. Apologize for giving you probably less than you expected on this particular talk. I think the discussion is good. RPA is going to stay very involved in trying to, to help practices figure these things out, and I would be certain that you all will actually be asked to help participate in figuring out how we organize ourselves to understand these things better. So thank you all very much.